The Spiritual Scientist podcast is joined today by Marietta van Buskoten. I hope I'm pronouncing it well. We, uh, we had a good little practice beforehand. <laughs> Thank you, Marietta. And Marietta is the General Secretary of the Anthroposophical Society in Great Britain and has a very interesting background in as a management consultant, as uh, someone working with you know creative solutions in places like the the oil industry in government with unions lots of different things and i've invited marietta on today because i heard a wonderful talk she gave at a conference in wales uh, regarding rudolf steiner's time and his visits in great britain and it was really wonderful so marietta welcome to the podcast thank you very much happy to be here thank you great to have you here so yeah um i would really like to start with a little bit of your background, if you don't mind, because uh, you've done some really interesting work, and also to hear about, you know, how you came into contact with Rudolf Steiner's work. If we could start there, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Well, I was born into uh, what one can call an anthroposophical family, a family that had, um, through two generations, been inspired by Rudolf Steiner. Uh, my grandparents. Uh, who lived in Vienna, met Rudolf Steiner. My grandfather was a young man. And um, he actually, on the on the side of my father's side of the family, he was Jewish. And uh, when he met Rudolf Steiner, very early on, in the very beginning of the 20th century, he was utterly uh, convinced that this was, for him, the inner path he was looking for. And so he remained, through his life, uh, very, very connected and ever more involved in the um, in the in and in, in with Rudolf Steiner's thoughts and in what then became the sort of the anthropo later on the anthroposophical society and the work that arose out of Rudolf Steiner's um, life. He was in fact a banker himself. That was his life's work, but all his energy um, uh, and within the family was connected around the work of Rudolf Steiner that inspired them all so much. And then um, my father, uh, really, who who also is a as a fairly young child, uh, met Rudolf Steiner, uh, and observed the was was so deeply impressed or moved by the respect that that his elders showed towards Rudolf Steiner that it raised the question question for him who is this man that so inspires the people who are important to me in my life. That was my father's question, and he started to read some books, and ultimately um, uh, he he joined the Anthroposophical Society later on and became a teacher in a Waldorf school, in a, in a Rudolf Steiner school, in a school inspired by Rudolf Steiner's ideas on education. And uh, I was a pupil in one of those schools in England, uh, in Gloucestershire, and went right through it from from kindergarten right up to um, leaving for university and felt deeply, deeply grateful for the whole of my background, including my education. But, and met some really deeply impressive people also through the friends of my parents. My mother and my father had many friends in these anthroposophical circles, all doing work arising from Rudolf Steiner's ideas. And uh, when I left school and asked myself, what, sh what should I do in, in my, with my life? Um, I felt I wanted to take the richness of what I'd been given with me, but I wanted to step out into what I called the real world, not just the world surrounded by other people who thought the same way as uh, my parents and, and their circle of friends. I wanted to go beyond that. And so first of all, I became a lawyer. I, pra uh, I trained in Gray's Inn. I then practiced for seven years um, and really met the um, full on, you know, life in the world of every possible sort. And later on, after having had two children, I changed career because I felt I wanted to make a shift from dealing with um, conflicts, usually by ending up in court, not always, but quite often, to saying, how can one resolve this out of a sort of higher part of oneself? So not going into battle, but going in, how can we create better understanding between people? And in that context, I decided 
partly because my husband was doing that work too and I was very interested in it, to become a management consultant. Um, and my work took me really into resolving mainly, apart from doing some leadership and management work, uh, the core of my work was in learning how to deal well with differences how to recognize the dynamic of interdependence and manage the dynamic of interdependence so that one learns to work together well, to work together creatively, to generate solutions together for mutual benefit, not to have winners and losers, but how can we together, realizing that there is some sort of problem, how can we resolve it in such a way that we both go away feeling that it's been resolved uh, through our own creativity and to generate the best possible results for both of us. Not that we all get everything we want, but we go away understanding this is how we came to this solution. This is the best solution we could have had in the circumstances. And I want to therefore remain committed to it and carry it through into action. And that, as you said in your introduction, brought me into very many different uh, situations um, working in many, many sorts of industries in many parts of the world, as well as a lot of work in government, some work in the EU, and so on, usually in big organisations. And what I noticed in that is that really, sadly, we see so much um, strife and difference in the world and divisiveness. But actually, in my experience was over very many years that people are longing to work together creatively and to generate good solutions and not to fight each other. But how to make that step uh, is a big challenge, but it can be done. I know it can be done. So that's that was my my work for, for many years. Wonderful. So it's interesting. Do you, you know, there's a sort of a public perception in a way about, for example, about Steiner education, Waldorf education, that it's purely for, well, in some circles, it, they think of it as purely for artists um, or some in some places it's the public perception is that it's for particularly gifted children in certain areas. Um, some places it's even considered a, a school for children who are not so gifted, who or maybe have learning difficulties and things like that. The public perception is is often strange. And then, you know, you're someone who actually went on to be a lawyer. So that's probably interesting for people to hear for a start. And then do you think that um, what was it in the education itself? Do you think that that gave you these abilities with creative solutions, working with people. Do you think that's a result of your education in a way or? Yes, I'm absolutely convinced it is a result of my education. Um, of course, when you're a child that grows up in that culture, it, it is the normal. You only notice it's not the normal when you step out into a bigger, a wider experience of life, as I did when I became a law student. And um, I was articled, as I mentioned earlier, in, in, in Gray's Inn, which is quite an invention, a conventional uh, part of the legal system. And uh, the legal system itself is quite in a conventional part of British life. So I came across people very different from myself. And it was there that I started to really realise what a gift my education had been. Um, that uh, I hadn't been pushed and rushed. I had plenty of time in the early years to learn to love the world, to love nature, to participate with it. Um, a lot of, you know, a certain amount of time to learn poetry and music and those sorts of things. And then as the years go by, of course, you focus more and more then on all the academic things that one needs to have achieved by the time one gets to university. So all of that happened, but it happened in rather a different way. And um, and I found that was very rich and fruitful, certainly for me. Doesn't necessarily mean that it applies to all children. Different children have different needs and feel, you know, find their their space and their environment in different places. But certainly for me, I felt uh, in retrospect, and that's never left me. To, you know, in fact, it's grown stronger over the years. Um, just the blessing that a really good Waldorf Steiner education. Uh, create, uh, gave me and created the basis for the rest of my life. And my ability, I think, to believe in myself sufficiently to say something, to, you know, to listen to what is my longing? What do I really want to do in the world? 
That was a big question for me, particularly when I was 18. And it was really to help other people with their problems. And that's why I first of all became a lawyer. But then when I moved on from that into the management consultancy work that I've just explained, you know, I felt I got so much from what I had learned from Rudolf Steiner about the importance of being interested in other people, in creativity, in thinking, in generating solutions together. A slightly sort of more artistic side of business, if you like. You know, not just going for the bottom line, but how can we together create things? Because ultimately, we can't achieve anything in life without other people. That became more and more real to me, and we, we can see it everywhere nowadays. This extraordinary interdependence we have as human beings, and now globally. And that needs to really be worked with. And I felt my background gave me the resources that I needed to do that work. So I'm very grateful for that. Sounds wonderful. Yeah, I'm a little bit jealous, really, of uh, people that <laughs> went to Steiner's because so I came to it. Uh, well, I I, did, I came across uh, Steiner's work in my early 20s, so that's that's nice and yes. early. But yes. yeah. Um, so something that sort of occurs to me out of that is that ultimately it really comes down to relationship, doesn't it? So when you're, it doesn't matter if you're do- dealing with an oil company, with the government, with a marriage, with a a teenager and a parent. It comes down to the relationship and the ability of one human being to relate to another. And I think you yes. said in there somewhere about just having an interest in the in the other person. And I mean, Stein, one of Steiner's definitions of morality was this very simple point, interest in the other. Yes. As a definition of morality. Yes. And so um, do you think that the education... Um, was there something in there that had an emphasis on relationship between, say, teacher, student, or the students themselves mm. that that led to that ability as well? Yes, I think you're right there. It did. I think one of the things one le- I learned in the Steiner School, and I think that probably is the experience of many people, is just a curiosity for life and for learning and for people and for discovering the world for oneself. And that includes, of course, an interest in other human beings. In fact, that is absolutely central. I think one of the things that um, is so important in relationship is this is trust. And also trust in marriage, trust in business, trust in government, you know, that you that you really work, you really trust the integrity and the word of the other person. Uh, and if that is there, then so much is possible that isn't possible if you don't trust people or if there is fear between you. I think fear is one of the most um, corrosive elements in human life. I love this phase, if I remember it um, properly, fear is a weapon of mass destruction. (laughs) I do believe that very much, how destructive it can be in so many areas. But if one can learn to know other people in the respect that one can also trust them, um, not that everybody's perfect, but that one one can really trust people, and if things go wrong, we can talk about them rather than just react to them and find solutions together. I think that is such a fundamental building block to stepping into the world and making things happen in a good way. There's some big themes in there. Yeah, trust. You know, and if you you mentioned government and trust in the those yes. words, yeah, you know, and um. You know, being able to trust people individually, but you know, there is a we're in a stage now where really a lot of people have zero trust in their governments or their leaders. So, yeah, some some big big thoughts and questions yeah. in there. Yes, there's a lot of cynicism um, now, and that's I'm perhaps there's always been, but I'm very aware of it right now, and uh, yeah. that's very very sad. You know, and one wonders where inspiring leadership has gone. What has happened to that? You can look all over the world and say, who are the people I really trust and would like to um, work with? Yeah, that's yeah, big oh, question. Mm. No, no, I there's a there's maybe one MP at the moment who I think's uh, speaking out about certain things which are difficult to say on YouTube. But uh, one MP out of how many MPs are there in the UK? Anyway, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's maybe a, uh, yeah. a discussion for another time, but um, yeah, it's great to hear about your background and how that education 
you know, enabled you to do what you wanted to do in life and also what you mentioned about that confidence. Um, maybe we could move into now talking a little bit about what I heard you speak about in Wales at this conference because uh, Rudolf Steiner made many visits to the UK. A lot of people don't know that. And he actually came to this area here. I'm in South Devon and he came and gave lectures in Torquay and then actually travelled down to Tintagel, yes. um, right. the supposed birthplace of King Arthur, where there's these castle ruins right on the cliff, actually pictured behind me, believe it or not, from the air. This is uh, Tintagel. And an extraordinary place. Extraordinary to think that he actually made that journey at that time as well. It wouldn't have been easy to get there, I imagine, back then. 1923, was it? Is that right? Yes, Marietta? 23 or 24. I think it might have been 24. 24, I think you're right. Yeah, the anniversary is coming up next year. Yeah, so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about his visits. You had them at, in the talk. You actually had them laid out, how many he did and, and what happened at each one. But I don't know how much detail you want to go into. Yeah. Maybe a little bit about Rudolf Steiner in Great Britain, what 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 that meant to him, what that meant to the yeah. movement itself, and yeah, whatever you want to, wherever you want to go with it. Good, right. Yes, well, when I became General Secretary of the Anthroposophical Society, um, and I, uh, which I should say was a big surprise to me that I ever did that, because, but um, when the question came, when the, a new General Secretary was being sought, and um, one or two people asked me, might I be interested? Um, it was something I'd never thought about. I was fully focused on the work I've just been talking about. But at the same time, when the question came, I recognised really that all the things that had gone so well in my life, it felt to me, you know, that I'd really um, felt so grateful for, were thanks to what I had learned from my education, from the Steiner education and from what I had learned from his body of work, which we call anthroposophy. And so I thought, well, if people really would want me to do this, I didn't think many would, um, because I was a bit different. But um, if they do, then I feel it's payback time. It's time to give back now um, from what all that I've been given. Well, it turned out that I did become general secretary and um, the gen and the sort of headquarters of uh, the Anthroposophical Society in Great Britain is in London, in a um, beautiful part of London, uh, Park Road near um, Regent's Park. And we have a beautiful building there and it has a library. And, um, and it also has a bookshop. And I recognized, uh, I realized as I watched people coming and going, that there were a, a group of people who did lots of diligent, committed study of Rudolf Steiner's work. And they would meet regularly in our library or in other rooms in the house and study his work. And other people came to the bookshop and bought all his books. But the question for me was, what do we know of Rudolf Steiner himself? We, you know, he's people work so hard on reading what he said uh, and trying to understand it is often not easy to understand. You often have to work at it quite a lot and it can be very helpful to work with others in groups so that people can bring their different perspectives of what they understand. But actually behind all this, behind all these shelves and shelves of books, is a human being. And who was this human being? And I also came to realise after a while um, that in Rudolf Steiner's life, which wasn't so long because he died at the age of 63, I believe, um, 63 or 65, I think 63, but anyhow, early 60s, um, who... Who, who, what was it like to be with him? What was it like to experience not his books, but him in front of us? Because so it's now, it's now um, very, very nearly a hundred years since, um, since the founding of the Anthroposophical Society. In fact, it is next month from when we're talking now between us, a hundred years to the founding of the Anthroposophical Society in Great Britain. And, um, and the memory of him as a person recedes more and more. And um, as I was trying to think about that, um, something came to hand which is absolutely invaluable to me and has become a real treasure. And it is two volumes of books, which I have here. And you can see how big they are. Look at that one and that one, well over one and a half thousand pages altogether, 
written by um, Crispian Villeneuve about Rudolf Steiner's visits to England. So you can imagine with so much material, very, very um, carefully researched. And when I started to read that, not only was I incredibly interested in what Rudolf Steiner had um, in his visits and what he had said in each of these visits, but also how people experience him, which really brought him to life, not only him as a human being, but the words he was speaking to them in a very different way from what we can gather and glean from no matter how much work we do with his books and his lectures. So Rudolf Steiner came to London and always to London, but often then to other places as well. But London was it, it, always London over 10 visits. The visit started in 1902 and ended in 1924, and he died early in 1925. Uh, and altogether, they amounted to five months of his life was spent in Great Britain, well, in, in Great Britain, yeah. And um, he traveled to several places. You've mentioned, of course, Tintagel. Um, he was in Stratford-on-Avon, in Torquay, in Oxford, in Kings Langley and Ilkley, and in Penmenmar in uh, North Wales as well. Those are some of the places that he that he visited and, and talked at, uh, gave lectures. And a group of, uh, you know, people, there were always groups of people around him, some of them, some of them also from the continent who came to listen to him, as well as all the English people who were there. So when he came in 1902, his very first visit, first of all, it was a very different sort of Great Britain, or a very different sort of London. In those days, um, he, of course, he came by train, he took a ferry crossing from the Hook of Holland to Harwich, and then by train to Liverpool Street Station, and when he walked out into the street, it was horses and carriages, men in top hats, all that sort of um, late Victorian, early Edwardian life that was there. Um, and he came for three summers, three consecutive summers. And the reason he came was because it was the annual convention of the Theosophical Society. And he had become general secretary of the, gen of the Theosophical Society in Germany. He was living in Berlin at that time. And uh, it was in that capacity that he came, firstly came to Great Britain. And then after um, 1904, these conventions moved elsewhere to other European cities. And then there was quite a long break until he came back again. But when he came there, um, his first connection to Britain was rather, uh, I would say, upper class intellectual um, connection um, his, he stayed firstly with the widow of a famous MP and she had a rather beautiful flat in St James's and uh, a beautiful house just outside London in Isha and that's how his, his first experience and he walked from where he lived to the Theosophical Society through um, often through Hyde Park and other beautiful parks that was sort of his first expressions. Nonetheless, um, I, I have a little excerpt from a letter he wrote to his wife, who remained behind in Berlin at that time, saying um, about his, his experience in 1903, saying, this is his second visit, the conference is very strenuous and the weather is very hot. I have again seen things of great interest, such as the old town of, town of Oxford, with its fine towers and wonderful university, and yesterday I was at the National Gallery to have a look at the landscapes of Turner, that glorious painter who filled me with so much enthusiasm last year. So he was very interested to get out and about and to, to delve into the sort of artistic cultural life of wherever he was, but also very much so in England. But also he was a man of the world. And he liked to go shopping. He liked to go to the theatre. Apparently he bought a bowler hat that he took back to Berlin. He also bought some snuff, which an English friend of his in Switzerland had said, go to Edgware Road, you can buy some nice snuff there, uh, uh, some nice British snuff. And so he went there as well uh, and, and, and did that. And um, working with the theosophists at that time, um, he was friendly, very friendly with the, one of the founders or the founder, I'm not quite sure, Annie Besant. Um, who worked quite closely with him at that time. And she said about him, he teaches the Christian and Rosicrucian way. 
and this is very helpful to some, but it is different from our way. I regard him as a very fine teacher, a man of real knowledge. He and I work through friendship and harmony, but along different lines. And I think this along different lines is sort of the clue to what happened next, because eventually those differences became bigger. And eventually then there was a particular incident, um, a particular event after which he felt, and, and I think Annie Bazant too felt, that their collaboration wasn't going to work anymore and they separated. And that was in 1912. Uh, Marietta, it might be worth actually mentioning that event. I know if you want to, if you don't want to, you yes, don't have to. But there, yes. are, there are so many people at the moment. Sorry, I've just got to check this cable. Um, there are so many people at the moment with these questions about what is the difference between anthroposophy and theosophy. You know, the whole New Age movement, in a way, came out of theosophy to some degree. And there are so many pe people out there asking these questions at the moment that to address what what happened a little bit might be useful if you feel comfortable to do it. Yes, I can't say that I know too much. Autumn. I know what the particular incident was that caused the final rift, which was that um, um, senior personalities in the Theosophical Society um, suggested that Krishnamurti was a reincarnation of Christ. And Rudolf Steiner said, this is not correct. Uh, from his own spiritual research, he felt this was not right, and he said so. But this was there was disagreement over that issue, it, um, and there, I think there was quite a body of enthusiasm for the, that thought that Krishnamurti was Christ, and they couldn't agree on that. And Rudolf Steiner felt he could, yeah, it just wasn't going to work after that. Mm -hmm. But. Um, and now I'm going a little bit more into speculation than, than real knowledge. But I would say that um, my understanding, which is limited of the Theosophical Society, is that they were, and I think probably still are, very much more connected with an Eastern spirituality, an Eastern sort of spirituality. It was founded in India, um, I believe, or it was its base was for a long time in India. Maybe I think it was actually founded in America, but its base was in India, I think, for quite a long time but I'm only I may be not right about these these details but uh, and Rudolf Steiner had great respect for eastern traditions and for the spirituality that came from from the east but his spiritual science was western it was for the western contemporary human being that's what he wanted to stand for he was after all a middle european he was born in, in within the Hungro Austrian Hungarian Empire. Um, his um, his university and student years were spent in Vienna with uh, major thinkers and intellectuals and artists of that time. He had a technical background. He was a very spiritual and gifted child, but he his background was he, he went to his training his university training was at the top uh, technical university in um in vienna he had a training in biology and chemistry and physics and mathematics um that was his background so it was a more scientific background but he also had this deep interest in philosophy and religions and he felt that he was very grateful always grateful to the theosophical society who had given him a base from which he could speak. Until the age of about 40, he had such rich inner life and spiritual insights that came to him, but they just lived in him and he didn't talk about them. And he found when he was in Berlin that uh, um, he, he, he met two theosophists, a couple who invited him into their, his, their house. And... Um, from there, he was invited into the Theosophical Society and into those circles where he could really talk about his spiritual background, his spiritual experiences, his spiritual investigations. And people listened. 
They didn't laugh at him. They listened respectfully and and he felt understood. And that's how that theosophical, how he came together with the, with, uh, the theosophists and was always grateful for the basis they gave him for his work and always respectful of them. But as Annie Besant herself said, we work out of different lines. And, that, and, and those lines, to go back to your question, I think was the difference between an Eastern and a Western approach to, to spirituality. And he felt his spirituality, not that it, it's only for Western people, but it came out of his Western upbringing and a culture and his understanding. And he felt very much that what he wanted to bring were insights that could give uh, resources, offer resources for the uh, challenges of the modern world. And he was a deeply modern human being. Even now, he's before his time, in a way, 100 years on. I mean, he was a very modern person. Yeah, I think that's a really good characterization of the whole episode, in a way, and and some of the differences. I think it's an important point in that you mentioned is his gratitude to the theosophical movement and the people involved. And I've recently spoken with a couple of people who also had a lot of spiritual experience throughout their childhood and and young younger years and what they talk about often is this real loneliness because they realize quite quickly all oh, right other people around me aren't experiencing what i'm experiencing they're seeing the world in a completely different way and then when they eventually either meet somebody else who can understand their experiences or shares them or at least is open to it or they come across a book um in these cases it was a book by steiner um not how to know higher worlds usually yes, <laughs> um, there's this incredible relief and this oh all right i can actually speak about these things i'm not mad i'm not completely different i'm not alone and so there's often this this gratitude even if the people even if what happens in that the stream that they enter at that point isn't where they end up they're always i've experienced this that they're often grateful to those very very grateful to those people and i think that's something a key note in steiner's life is is this this gratitude even when he's quite critical of modern science and darwin darwinism or whatever it is he's talking about he always throws in there we must have immense gratitude to the scientific revolution or whatever, because without it, without certain things occurring in human evolution, in the evolution of consciousness, um, even the anthroposophical worldview might not have been born in the same way. So, yeah, I think just one of those points to, to pick up on that's really important. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I agree with that. And Steiner always had great respect for scientists. Um, he did, but he also could identify where the limitations were because, exactly. you know, there comes a boundary to what you can think if you think completely materialistically. But if you can cross that boundary into a more inspired, open, creative thinking, then much more richness can enter in. And that's what he wanted to bring through uh, his spiritual his spiritual science. It's interesting that he bring those two words together, The mm -hmm. another word for anthroposophy is spiritual science and um, which needs to be as exact as natural science. But going back to um, what you said just now, I think actually at this time, there are more and more people going around with inner questions because the conventional churches don't offer the answers anymore. Uh, that not answers that satisfy. Even if people go there, a lot of people don't anymore. Many people have their own inner questions. I think that has a lot to do also with the, I would almost say, epidemic of mental health issues at the moment. You know, who am I really? What is the meaning? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Where have I come from? Where am I going to? These are all questions I think nearly everybody asks themselves. And for some people, it's just too complicated or, you know, okay, let it go. But I think more and more people are not letting it go because it's it's there and it's real. And um, 
Yes, and I think Rudolf Steiner is one person who can offer, you know, some people find help and answers in one place and some in another, but my own experience, and some people don't find any help at all, and that's, I believe, a tragedy. But um, in my experience, uh, particularly um, working out of London in Rudolf Steiner House, you know, more and more people come in with exactly these questions, and they come from all walks of life. And it's deeply humbling and impressive and moving to hear the stories that people bring about their inner searching. And um, I feel it's important to to hear these uh, and not to tell them what they need to believe and what they need to think or that Rudolf Steiner is the right person, but to uh, you know help deepen their own questions and um, let them, and, and encourage them to to take them seriously. I think that's important. Yeah, I agree. I think there's so many people asking so many question inner these deep inner questions about existence, mm. especially today. And it's a some really important points there because people tend to go, I think, sort of one of four ways to paint it to paint it very simply. But yeah. there's either either the dive into full on materialism, you know, I just yeah. make as much money as I can, be as comfortable as I can enjoy life the pleasures of life kind of way of being there's the uh the dive into religious dogmatism which is actually i don't know if you experience this but a lot of people in, in circles that i know about are actually going that way and in some ways that's actually a reaction to what they've been doing in the new age for want of a better term the new age you know I, had, mm. I know of someone recently who was actually a kundalini yoga person and was very much into that path and then had a spiritual experience, possibly a negative one, and then that flung them right over into religious dogmatism and 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 going around saying, you know, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, you're going to hell and all this kind of stuff. And I think that's why it's so important what you just said that there is another way. There is a way to be open to these existential questions, these questions about what we are as human beings, why are we here, etc. that doesn't make us have to drift away from the earth into this a sort of bliss land, away from the practicalities of the day-to-day -day struggle. But also we don't have to fall into dogmatic concepts that we have to do this and we have to do that to be good and get into heaven and all that but we also don't have to fall into pure materialism there's another way and it's when it's done in the way that you just said with open questions not in a this is what you have to believe um, then people can find their own way they can find the next question for themselves i was really lucky when i came into anthroposophy i met someone um a priest in the christian community in melbourne australia and what i felt walking in there was complete and utter freedom there was no no one said i'll oh, come back next week or <laughs> you know no one it was it was kind of this standing back and leaving me completely free and i'd never experienced that in a spiritual or religious movement or anything like that ever before so yeah i think partly why i'm doing this just to say that briefly this youtube channel is to just highlight that that there is a there is a third or a fourth way whatever we want to call it yes. so thank thank you for sharing all that um maybe if we could come back to um rudolf steiner in great britain and yes. some more about because i know you have a really good grasp of all of that so i'd, I'd love to hear more about that yes yes but thank you just before i do that i would like to just stress um underline what you said then about these different approaches and people having uh inner questions and people deal with it in different ways and i think for rudolf steiner one of the things that was very important for him was that he was not for anybody at all a guru he did not want to be a guru he did not want to be believed he wanted to be understood uh, that's what he wanted that people understand what he's saying but then make their own free relationship to it and not just follow blindly. That was one of his huge exasperations because because he was so much ahead of everybody else, I think, at that time that I certainly know of, 
You know, people tended just to follow him blindly. Uh, and he didn't want that at all. And he repeated it over and over again. He wanted people to have the feet on the, their ground, not get carried away into the bliss that you talked about, but stand in the world with a love for the world and an interest in the world, but also a recognition that within this world, there's also um, a spiritual reality as well as a material reality. They're both there. And uh, that was what he wanted to bring. So going back now, as you say, to the thread of his visit to, um, to England, which uh, we've sort of moved uh, with a little bit. Um, so I said he left the Theosophical Society and that was in 1912. And in 1913, the Anthroposophical Society was founded. And that was in, uh, it started in Cologne in Germany. And, um, uh, Sorry, something's just arrived on my screen. Take it away. Um, yes, it, in Germany. And immediately after leaving the Theosophical Society, he came back to Britain. So there'd been then this gap, these frequent visits to 1902, three, four, five. And then after that, nothing until uh, uh, 1913. Uh, when the Anthroposophical Society had then been founded and he had left. But in the meantime, over those years, between 1905 and 1913, um, the impression he had left behind from his visits to, to London particularly had been such, and the, the, uh, the books that he had written that people had studied, that groups had taken this very seriously and worked together in London. So when he came back in 1913, there were quite a strong group of people who also... Uh, were the still theosophists as uh, as well who really really wanted to work more with Steiner's thoughts and and stayed with him there and those are the people he began to work with particularly in 1913 uh, when he came back to rather a different Britain then because the feeling was uh, first of all you know it was it wasn't any more horses and carriages but motors and trams and these sort of things were more around so one could feel. Uh, a changing world, but also a world full of threat now in 1913 because of the coming war. And, and Rudolf Steiner, with his particular um, um, in abilities, uh, was able to, you know, already sense what was coming uh, and the tragedy and the disaster that was lying ahead already in 1913. Um, so when he came back uh, in his first lecture, it's very nice. He 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 came back and um, uh, first of all greeted people in a in a very nice way, which was uh, really saying. And if I can find um, the, the 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 text of what he said there, it was um, very much about uh, people being you know greeting people to unite together without any distinction of race color or any such thing is how he greeted people so i'm so glad to be back in london with you and to be with you again my dear friends and to meet out of anthroposophy and unite without distinction of race color or any such thing and then he went on very soon in that lecture in fact to talk about the importance of inner work of inner meditative work and what he stressed there, which, I mean, he often talked about inner work, that was because that was actually core to everything. But the particular emphasis he put on it in 1913 was that when one works inwardly, it is a reality for those people who have died, who are within your sort of environment, the people you knew, that one can connect. And it really is a sort of a nurturing, a feeding of the soul, if one can stay connected through one's inner work. And I read into that uh, because of the emphasis he put on it, this sense, as I mentioned, of how many people would lose loved ones in the coming years. And he was trying to prepare people for that work and for that consciousness that uh, these these young people who would die in their thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions, uh, you know, were, were there somewhere to be reached. And that was important for them. Could I just um, pick up on that just one second yes, just before you move on? My, um, I haven't spoken to you about this, but my work is mainly with people who are grieving, who have lost someone, okay. and, and we yes. move beyond the sort of general way of grief counselling yes. and into actually talking about the spiritual reality of loved ones of, that have died, you know, that, that they're always with us in yes. many ways, and that yes. 
this this concept that that I hear heard first from Steiner that actually we can help them, we can support yeah. those that have died, and mm. when we do our inner spiritual work, especially if we do it um, in connection with thinking of them and possibly even reading spiritual things to those that have died we actually nourish them and help them on their continued journey as it were and that actually allows them to or enables them to help and support us more for our daily life here on earth and so i think that that insight um just just to highlight that because in my work when i i didn't know this was going to happen in my work but when i've brought that concept to people it has changed everything for them in their lives in terms of um you know people are in their grief they're in their pain and it's not about pretending that's not happening or um what's it called spiritual spiritually bypassing the pain of the grief it's real yes. but yet we can work with it and and lessen it and move through it and um work with it by actually working with the spiritual world so thank you for bringing that up i just wanted to yes that resonates that very strongly with me what you say there absolutely absolutely so to, i would like to now make, make a shift a little bit to how people experienced him at that time which takes me back to the, the, the very beginning when i said you know we have all these books but we perhaps don't can't understand the, the human being behind behind all of that so easily and um the person who hosted him then in that in that week in um for a week when he came back in 1913 said this we that meant he and his wife looked upon this week as the most sacred in our lives when we were able to shelter our beloved leader and teacher uh you know so there was a very very strong experience of somebody who was really special to them uh beloved to them uh and and was sort of both leading and teaching and uh this was often an experience that people had of rudolf steiner um and one can imagine if it is so strong that one also then wants to hang on his every word and, and be a follower which yeah that, that's that, that's a good point i was just going to say how easy the, that can become yeah, yeah the word leader has yeah. you know some connotations yeah. to it like that's right. you have to be careful that's but right. yeah and I think that has been a danger for a hundred years. I mean, it's still in a way today that if Rudolf Steiner said it, it must be right. If Rudolf Steiner indicated this, then he has to be right. And that's the way. And that's where dogmatism can creep in around the edges. Where in fact, as I said earlier, what he wanted was that people think for themselves. They consider his ideas, take them seriously, and then weigh it up within themselves and make their own independent independent free relationship to them and there's a little tiny little incident i'll just tell you um which sort of indicates uh, really the frustration rudolf steiner must have felt in this regard because one day when he was in switzerland he was walking home for lunch with a friend and he stopped on the path and uh, took his shoe off and the person walking with him said hey doctor you know what's what, what's the problem and he said well i've got a little stone in my shoe and if i limp today the whole of the village will be limping tomorrow so you know, even in that regard, yeah. whatever he did, he was copied. Didn't want that to happen. Good. So, um, so, so that was how he was described there. Um, when one looks at photos of Rudolf Steiner, he always looks rather earnest and stern. Uh, I think that was sort of the fashion at the time. A photographer came around. We didn't all have our mobile phones where you just snap any time. But there was a child who did have a camera. I don't know if it was her camera or she got it from somewhere. But she snapped him, jumping out of a bush at him. And that's the only picture one has of him really smiling, has a broad smile on his face. Otherwise, he looks uh, very earnest. Uh, but he was a man of great humour. And, for example, that never comes across in the books. But he was a man of really, uh, he loved to have fun. He loved to, you know, over meal times and during journeys and times like that, when he was with people, they would relate anecdotes. They would laugh. A great deal um, when he came to Holland uh, to found the Dutch Anthroposophical Society, and then afterwards he went for a meal. He started telling anecdotes and talking, and his laugh. His wife laughed so much she said, "Please stop because I just can't take the pain of my ribs any longer. I can't, you know, that just, you know, that he was, he was very lively, 
he wasn't all as earnest as he looked. So in 1913, he was 52 years old. He um, he had this beautiful black hair. It was full black hair, uh, dark, glossy, and a bit floppy. So when he spoke, he was very animated. And many people, including um, reporters from the various newspapers who used to also attend many of his public lectures, would speak about his lively presentation. His head would fly and his hair would go this way and his hands would do that. And his voice was very modulated. So even though he spoke in German, his English got better and better over time. And for example, he was able to go shopping and come out with what he wanted in English. Um, but he didn't want to disturb what he was saying by having to always um, search for the right word and compromising. So he made his his lectures were in German, but he had various forms of translation. I might come a bit more to that later on. Um, uh, or translators. He had some really excellent translators, particularly one. Um, but people used to say it didn't matter so much what language he spoke because his presentation itself was so lively. The modulation of his voice, the earnestness in his eyes, the sight in his eyes that seemed to gaze so far into the beyond when he was speaking, when he was there in front of the podium, on the podium, um, that um, his whole, what we would call today body language was really a language that people could understand. So the barrier between English and German was not as big as one might think it would be. He was medium height. He was lean. He was very upright. He had a very lively, sprightly step as well. Um, and um, he he used to wear a sort of long jacket and then a floppy tie somewhere here. And um, that was, off, you often see that in the pictures, in the photographs. So here are one or two impressions of people who sat in on those lectures in 1913, who participated. Um, I shall never forget the deep impression Rudolf Steiner made on me when entering the lecture room. Deep reverence and great inner concentration were shown when he walked onto the podium. Now, I think this, this reverence um, and concentration is what he says again and again is a prerequisite for meditation and for an, for an inner contemplative mood. And that is the mood he took up as he walked forward onto the podium so that when he stood in front of people, they could really experience how the insights from that spiritual world poured into his words and through him to the, to the specific audience in the room. And I emphasize the word specific because he was always very, very conscious of who was present in the room, where they were. So being in London would be very different from being in Munich or being in Vienna. He spoke to the people and to the context of that time, of what was happening around them at that particular time. So it was very time spe specific, and that needs to be borne in mind when one reads his lectures, which are different from his books, which were meant for everybody to read wherever they were and whenever they picked them up. But the lecture was very specific to who was there. And that sometimes also can be frustrating when you read him say something in one place and it's said in this way and it's said in a different way in another place. And you think, well, he's contradicting himself. But if one thinks to that way of working, it was because he was intuiting what was living in the people and how best to address those people in that room at that moment. Another impression. During lectures, he revealed a side of his being which in normal life was not so apparent. Rudolf Steiner stood before us as the great initiate. This was again and again a tremendous experience with every lecture he gave. One felt taken up into a super sensible brotherhood and at the same time called upon to take part in a great battle for the well-being of all humanity. And I'll just stop in that quote for a moment because the well-being of all humanity was at the core of what he of what he was trying to achieve. It was not for a tiny group of people who studied his lectures or for people who belonged to a particular society. It's for all humanity that he wanted to bring what he was bringing. And clearly the person sitting there in the audience uh, recognized that. I'll continue. One felt united with everything one had striven for and participated in through numerous lives. 
This gave us strength and enthusiasm for the achievement of our earthly tasks. So this person is recognizing in Rudolf Steiner that as I sit here in the audience, I bring with me not only, you know, the life that I live now, but that I have that there has been previous lives before, going back to ancient times. And these have one by one, they have influenced and developed and shaped me over time, just as the whole world is evolving over time. So the human being evolves through incarnations. And this was a, an experience. I mean, this is very much what Rosh Dina talked about, what he called karma and reincarnation. But it was a real experience when people sat there, the reality of what he was saying. One could experience that as one listened to them. And also in hearing him talk, speak like that was a huge, what he talked about, about strength and enthusiasm it gave people. And one can understand that now looking back 100 years as I'm doing at the moment to remember some of those inspired pioneers who started the work in Great Britain. They gave so much. They were so committed. Uh, they were so burning with enthusiasm to do things for the world that had been a sort of fire that had been caught through what Rudolf Steiner or had been, uh, had been um, instigated through experiencing Rudolf Steiner himself. That was very real. Here comes another quote. I shall never forget the extraordinary impression this man made on me when he entered the room. As I looked at that thin, powerful face, at the black, mysterious eyes flashing light as from an unfathomable depth, it was borne in on me that for the first time in my life, I was face to face with one of those supreme seers who have direct vision of the great beyond. So, I mean, to, to sort of try and imagine oneself talking, standing in front of or sitting in front of somebody who was able to give such an experience, and I think it wasn't just this person, I think it was most people who went there, not everybody, but most people who went there really felt, you know, how insights from across a boundary, from across a threshold, um, from another form of reality were pouring through him into his words and into the room. That was a huge uh, uh, experience um, and and a very precious one, I, I, I can only imagine. When I think it's great. So, sorry, Marietta, just to, yeah. get, just to break in there for a second, but it's really interesting to juxtapose that with this uh, person with a great sense of humor, this very down to earth practical person as well. I think, you know, enormous spiritual gifts, uh, insight, actually presence as well that people were able to sense and they were ab able to have these deep experiences themselves, coupled with this incredible practicality. You know, when the the uh, Goethe Arnhem, this building which had he'd um, was the architect of and helped to build for over this period of time in, in Switzerland. Um, when the fire started uh, or when they first discovered the fire, he straight away ran down to the, I think that is where the heating system was or whatever it was to see what had gone wrong or what they could do to do it. So there's this very, this presence of mind. Yes. And also um, there's some, the, the great anecdotes you've got there about the humor there are some other really good ones in other books as well. I won't go into it now, but um, you just get this sense of this, uh, such an, a rounded personality yes. Um, yes. as well as everything he brought. Sorry, just wanted yes. to throw that in. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. He was a very, very practical person. And the story that you're telling there about when it was on fire and he went down to the, um, to the, to the boiler room or the boiler house uh, to check everything was working properly was also that he realized the insurance might say, well, there was something wrong with your boiler. It was a very innovative modern boiler. Maybe it failed and caused a fire. So he okay, and he, yeah, took right. two, he took two witnesses with him who were both people who understood this. So they all looked at it together to check there's nothing wrong here. And then they went to the electrical box in the it, again in, in the Gurdjianum and checked there were no fuse problems, no electrical problems. Um, you know, so yes. Sort of really strategic earthly thinking, as well as this big, big, big visions that he he could bring in these big insights. 
as well yeah. as well as sorry just one one more thing as well as the philosophical uh thinking ability you know to yeah. I think he was 14 years of age and he was reading Immanuel Kant's Limits Absolutely. to Knowledge and things like that, you know, a, a critique of pure reason. I can't yes. remember which which book. Yeah. But... No, you're quite right. No, there's so many uh, such such stories, exactly as, you, as you're describing them, that, that, that paint a picture of a really, um, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but a really fully established human being in every sense. And yet, this additional ability, this huge ability, um, to to work with the other reality that lives so strongly in him, equally strongly, if not more strongly, actually, uh, of the reality of a of a spiritual world as well, the the inter inter reacting, inter penetrating every aspect of everyday life. So, in in that first talk, I'll just mention a little bit about it because. Um, he talked about, as I mentioned earlier already, this um, the uh, the importance of the inner work in relation to many things, but also in relation to uh, taking up contact with souls, disincarnate souls across the threshold. He also was very aware that in London, particularly at that time, um, it was a core centre of materialism and of the forces of materialism that, as you said, just now um separate oneself from the spiritual world you know it's all about matter and things and what one has and probably having more and more of what one wants and those sorts of things but all about matter and logic and technology and so on not bad in themselves but but they become an end in themselves they become it they become what life's about and uh he wanted to warn that one would get sucked more and more into this world of materialism um, if one didn't recognise that forces were pushing him in that direction and that to stand up and be, um, you know, to find one's full humanity was both to live in that world as well as recognise how it works on one and find a counterbalance to it through one's inner life. And he spoke very, very much um, in London in, in, that, in those tones quite often. He also spoke very specifically about very particular things like education and other things as well. But um, but that that was a theme of coming to, to Great Britain um, and, or particularly to London. Um, this the onslaught of materialism, which, of course, has only grown and grown and grown in these last 100 years. And with it again and again, that the spiritual world exists. You know, not to forget there is a spiritual world there and and the resources that can be enabled if one connects as you have talked about in your work as, as a very good example of that. And he also talked in Britain um, and in London uh, very much about a re the relationship to Christ at this time. Not only the relationship to Christ as a uh, phenomena, as a reality, as a fact of 2000 years ago, of which he writes a lot, uh, and takes deeply seriously. There's a lot of work at that time, but also that that the the presence of Christ among us today, and not Christ in the sense of coming out of any particularly religious um, background or, or or belief system, but rather as a um, a spiritual, the core spiritual friend of humanity as such the core spiritual um, companion for all human beings, and most particularly in times of suffering and need, in times when you lose yourself, when you lose hope in yourself, um, the importance of um, lose hope in your life, the importance of recognising this being, this high, high being that is there for all humanity. And he talked about that also both in, in that visit that I keep coming back to of 1913, but then after the long war years when he came back again for three visits in 1922. Uh, and that was the theme he immediately picked up again. And he also picked up again the theme of inner work. And again, he said very much to the, I think, to the English people, not that I've studied exactly what he said in all the other countries he visited, but it seems to me that he put a particular emphasis in England on that when we talk about inner work, 
we should not confuse it with mediums, with seances, with trances, or with visions. That his, what he is trying to bring in relation to inner work is what we consciously and in full inner wakefulness uh, work with. It's not about putting yourself, dulling your consciousness. It's about almost a super consciousness that comes through your own will to, to, to enable it. So it's an it's not a question of letting go. It's a question of taking up one's will to open then to what um, leaving trying to let go of the everyday you or me or us for a moment and opening up to a higher reality. And that is an, a question of exercising one's will, one's one's commitment, one's conscious wish to make that happen. That's a, uh, cru a crucial distinction, I think, Marietta, especially today as well, between trance states, mediumism, where, you know, if we're sort of characterizing it correctly, we're talking about dampening consciousness and being less conscious and other beings or other forces or whatever coming in through us. And that's not what Rudolf Stein is talking about he, or doing um, even when he's on stage, like you say, giving these lectures and people are having these experiences and he's bringing um, information into yeah. the world or however you want to want to say it. It's not a dampening of consciousness. It's a, a heightening of consciousness. As you say, it's like super consciousness yeah. in a way. Yes. Um, Marietta, just before you go on, I just have to turn my power onto my computer because it's getting low. So just one second, but you, you uh, can, you can, you can keep going. <laughs> okay. I will do. Right. So I think just adding on what you've just brought there, uh, Mick, um, he also talks about uh, the importance therefore not of medium seances and tra trances and these sorts of things, but what he calls exact clairvoyance, which he says an, an imperative requirement of our age. That time to just let, let it all happen is over in a sense that one needs to be deeply conscious of one's inner activity and make it exact. He says as exact and real as uh, as conventional science in the physical world, just as one, uh, you know, any scientist making an experiment will think carefully about their research and how to set it up and how to do it with discipline and objectivity. So also one's inner work. So to, to be patient, to take time, not just to believe that any experience you might have is a real experience. It might be just a projection. It might be a fantasy. You know, you come to understand what is real and what Neil real through practice and work. And he gives indications about how to do that. And uh, he made that quite clear warning, I think, to, particularly in, in, in England, okay. where we love, um, you know, things like seances and mediums and I don't know that that's how I see it that's how I understand it um now there was a very clear distinction when he came back in 1922 from the previous work because over those years of the war and the years immediately after the war many people had come to him in despair about the way modern life was going and the disasters and tragedy of the first world war and they came with their questions they came with many questions. What can be a new form of education so that people can grow up to nurture their creativity and whatever, whatever, that sort of thing? Or what can be a new form of an inspired form of art? Or how can one bring a, um, a modern form of medicine that brings with it the wisdom of the past, but is scientific as well? Many, many questions like that. And he tried to answer and work with every question. So by the time he came back to Britain, he had already been working now in many bringing this this body of scientific of, of um, spiritual science into many practical areas of work. I think some, this is um, set sort of spiritual science probably apart from most other um, spiritual uh, initiatives organisations um, in that it is really. It moves really into the space of everyday practical life. How can you bring this really grounded in the world so it acts for good in the world? As I experienced, going back to our beginning, in my in my education, 
you know, what I got out of it. So people, leading teachers at that time were coming to him and saying, Dr. Steiner, can you please help us to bring a new form of education that really helps nurture the fullness of every child? Not, not that it funnels it into a particular way of thinking, but it nurtures its inherent uh, ability and, and potential to really find itself and that the child become more of who that particular child is and yet live fully in the world. Uh, and that was just one one of many things. And so when he came back in 1922, there were people who were who had been reading and following uh, what he had been of the developments uh, that had been happening in Europe uh, around Rudolf Steiner and in the field of education, very much so. Um, in the field of agriculture, that is where, in due time, biodynamic agriculture, which is now a very recognised leading form of um, of sustainable uh, agriculture, not only sustainable, but also building a healthy world, building a healthy soil, healthy crops, healthy animals, and therefore, of course, healthy human beings who eat and uh, who live on the land and eat those crops. That came from him. One could say, in a, in a way, he was the father of organics. I'm sure there were other people working. I don't want to say he was the only one, but he was very leading. And that was at the time when the first pesticides and other things were being put onto the soil and people were worried about the longer term consequences that may have. And he was he had also developed then, you mentioned already, he built um, this wonderful, wonderful centre called uh, the Gutianum, the first Gutianum, because it was there was it was then followed by a second after the first one was burnt down. But he brought so many artistic forms into this building, not only into its design, incredibly inspired design, but also into the glass, the glass work, the, the windows that were coloured, that were engraved in completely new ways, the carving of the wood, uh, the paintings, and so much else that was innovative and artistic and that inspired many, many artists. Hilma Alf Klint being one of them. There's just an exhibition at the moment at the Tate Modern. Um, uh, Kandinsky, Kandinsky and many, many others were just amazed. But that was just one of the things, one of the many things, practical things he, he was bringing down over those years. And so when he came back to Britain in 1922, um, the three times he came in April, August and November. He came again in August and September of 1923. And then finally, when we talked about uh, Tintagel, which I'm still seeing behind you there, uh, 1924, he was in Torquay, Tintagel in London then. You know, in all those last visits, um, it was very much focused not only on the spiritual content that he had been bringing before and developing all the time since, but also in the, into the practical implications and the practical implementations of the spiritual work, bringing these insights into practical realities that people will take up. So many people then collected around him, these pioneers infused by him to say, how can I do this work? How can I take up this work? And interestingly enough, he was invited, for example, to um, a conference on dramatic art and, art and education at Stratford-on-Avon at the time of, uh, of, of Shakespeare's birthday. And, and it's amazing that as a, as a foreigner, particularly uh, just after the war, he was asked to give the keynote lecture for to celebrate um, Shakespeare's uh, birthday that year. And uh, there's a lovely anecdote because he loved going to Shakespeare plays. He held Shakespeare in very, very high esteem. And he went to six plays during the time he was there in 1922, one of them being Twelfth Night, where he enjoyed the performance of Sir Andrew AQG so much that he laughed so loudly in the audience that all the people sitting in the rows in front of him sort of turned round to look and think, who's laughing behind me so loudly? <laughs> and even the actors on the stage then starting started to work laugh to um to laugh because he could really appreciate the richness of what Shakespeare was trying to give and what Shakespeare was trying to say. He could, it really penetrated him so deeply. It lived in him so deeply that um he was so strongly moved. And that brought out also the, the, the laughter among other things that happened there. But um, he also, going back to this um, practical work that he was bringing down, there was somebody, a very prominent professor in, in the field of education, Millicent McKenzie, who was one of many, many people who was really listening to what he was saying in order 
to find a new um, a new form of education that then became the whole Waldorf movement, the whole Rudolf Steiner schools movement that has now gone all around the world in in in, in many different forms. The Times reported on that con on that conference, saying the famous person at this year's conference was Dr. Rudolf Steiner, who is distinguished at present not only in the field of education but also in other fields. In the light of spiritual science, he promises teachers relief from unnecessary difficulties through learning to know the soul of the child with the help of supersensible knowledge. Speaking in the German language, Rudolf Steiner was able to hold his audience in an extraordinary manner, in spite of the interpretations interjected after each 20 minutes. And so on. So, wow, uh, can you can you imagine anything like that being writ written in the Times today, Maria? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And um, the Yorkshire News also wrote about him. A distinguished visitor visitor who spoke at the Hippodrome was Rudolf Steiner. He is a passionate, devoted Shakespearean, and he says that to visit Stratford during the, this festival has been one of the dreams of his life. With his deep black hair, he looks much younger than his 61 years, and he discoursed to a large crowd of teachers in fluent, eloquent German. It is a good many years since Shakespeare was eulogized in his birthplace in the German tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then also that uh, the local Herald newspaper from, from Stratford said, Rudolf Steiner spoke of his ideals, which were still valid, and he believed because they came from of Shakespeare's ideals, that is, uh, which are still valid, he believed, because they came from a reality of the spiritual world and were not abstract and shadowy as so many ideals put forward in the modern world. And therefore, Shakespeare's power endures. They, are, they were drawn from the same source as from which the ancient mysteries drew their strength, but in an entirely new way, and so on. But That's now, so, go sorry, go on. Sorry, please. No, after you. No, no, just to, to hear these words, even to hear the words soul and spirit in the, yes. you, you don't see it in the newspaper anymore. No, sorry, no, no. sorry, uh, sorry to yeah. cut you off. Please. Well, just let me add then in that same place, just to continue with what you have said, this reporter said, um, in the spiritual world, Rudolf Steiner had said, the characters we meet in the plays do not disappear like those created by lesser authors but retain a life of their own. And that is why they remain ever fresh and alive for us. Wow. So you're right. The, the, you know, that could be printed in those days without creating ridicule. Nowadays, it would draw ridicule and mockery straight away. But I'd also like to mention, um, I mentioned that he was being interpreted in these lectures. Mm -hmm. And one of the interpreters, the last one, was somebody called George Adams who was really a, a genius in language and in being able to understand what Rudolf Steiner was saying, retain it for 20 minutes and then repeat it in English. I mean, extraordinary. But this is Rudolf, this is George's, George Adams' um, description of his experience, his impressions of meeting Rudolf Steiner. And the first ones I read you came from 1913. Now I'm going up to his impressions in 1922. My impression, even in those first, few days was of many Rudolf Steiners. There was the simple, friendly gentleman. There was Rudolf Steiner lecturing, deeply impressive and stern, vivid in characterization, then often moving into anecdote and good-natured satire, as well as rollicking fun and humour. And there was Rudolf Steiner speaking at a more esoteric me meeting, the initiate from timeless realms. And Rudolf Steiner, as you might meet him in a personal interview, the deep, silent look in his eyes, the warm kindness and encouragement at some moments, and at other moments, absolutely quiet, in silent waiting. waiting. And if I add to that impression, it comes up time and time again when one gets uh, moves away from the lectures to the personal experiences of individuals in their own relationship to him one-on-one, -on -one, the kindness, the understanding, the holding himself completely back 
so that the person in front of him could really be fully present, that they could feel themselves really being seen by somebody else in a way they had never been seen before. It is a unique gift to when another human being really sees you. And that he was able to do, to really see who this person was also in their yet unrealized potential. And possibly, if wanted and if appropriate, to give them then some resource to help them move forward in their lives. A personal meditation, a personal thought, an idea of what they might do, that sort of thing he was able to do. But he was able to completely still himself. It says here, absolute quiet in silent waiting. And his kindness and his warmth and his humanity were all overwhelming, unforgettable experiences that people remembered throughout their lives. They may have met him in their 20s or 30s, but in their 70s and 80s, they were still reliving these memories as so unique and precious and blessed. And then there's just one, not one, I've got plenty more, but you, I don't want to go on longer than you want me to. But also there was this meeting with this important personality of the Anthroposophical Society, which was Daniel N. Dunlop, who became the second general secretary and was very much the sort of person that Rudolf Steiner really rejoiced in, in that he was a man of the world. He was fully out doing things in the world and is very much remembered for the World Power Conferences that he initiated, he founded. It was his idea to have a World Power Conference. This continues under a different name. I think it's now called the World Energy Conference, if I remember rightly. Um, but his but continues every single year. But uh, Daniel Donlop founded it. And he recalls a meeting with Rudolf Steiner in 1922, and they felt a very, very deep bond for each other, even though they only met right at the end of Rudolf Steiner's life. Daniel Donlop uh, describes this. This meeting brought instant recognition. So he felt he met somebody who he'd actually known a long time before. And he doesn't say where or when, but, you know, that there was already a basis of knowing between them. And, and it feels as though that was mutual. Here was the knower, the initiate, the bearer of the spirit of his age. And I think that's very important. The bear, he wanted to bring the spirit for this age. He wanted to bring an inner life, an awareness of the spiritual world appropriate for the modern human being. The human relationship was established between us immediately. A clasp of the hand that lasted for several minutes. A conversation which took its course in ordinary language, but seemed to lie in a realm of understanding infinitely deep and was filled with an indescribable sweetness and warmth. So another very deeply um, descriptive uh, and uh, impressive description of, of, of meeting and knowing him. Now, uh, there was much, much more about um, people's understanding, people's experience of Rudolf Steiner. And there were many, many strands to what he brought in Great Britain. From going, you know, from what he could say about coming to Tim Tagel, from what he said about the Druid circles and the standing stones in North Wales at Penmenmar, where you and I uh, met each other. And many, many, many other things and strands weaving through what he brought at this time. But I feel now perhaps that, you know, we I can't give everything and say everything. So um, I would like now to come to the very ending, really, the last visit, the visit where he did go to Tintagel and to Torquay. Um, and that ended up then in London with the founding of the Anthroposophical Society in Great Britain. Um, so one of the teachers that he worked with um, for the world of for the founding of the world of schools of someone called Helen Fox, and she was there at Tintagel and uh, and and in London, and she wrote also about her, her experiences now coming right to the very end of his life, because this last visit to England was about a month to six weeks before he had to take to his bed, and eventually he and and that was the beginning of his uh, long illness of about six months. 
until his death in March 1925. But uh, this is what he said about the last, the last visit from Helen Fox. This last summer of his lecturing life was so grand, yet filled with certain sadness. We could see Rudolf Steiner's physical body fading before our eyes, yet as we listened to the tremendous cycle of lectures on karmic relationships, as he lighted it up for us ever and again with rousing spontaneous laughter, even when unfolding the most tremendous themes, it was difficult to believe that this individual spirit, which was so amazingly triumphing over physical weakness, could ever really succumb. We did not want to think of it, but the evidence grew clearer. I saw him once at dusk, stepping into a waiting car with no one near, and I could see the pathetic frailty of his body. I was shocked by its frailty. Yet when he came to the podium, looking as though all his clothes had become a size too small, too large for him, one had to hold one's breath and think, can he do it? And then one realized that when he stood there in front of the phone, he summoned such strength that he was really animated and alive. But then his strength did not hold him up and he sank away again. And when people came, went to Victoria Station to say goodbye to him when he finally left England, another person said, sitting in the railway carriage, he looked worn and ill. And as we went in to take our leave of him, his whole face then lit up with a warm smile. He shook my hand and he said, Auf Wiedersehen, alles Gute. I felt that this was not so much a personal wish of saying goodbye, but a deep desire and concern that the work we were undertaking should succeed here. So he had so enlivened and enriched the lives of people who were striving for something new and different and modern that combined work in the world with deeper insights. He had so enthused these people. They were now well on their way. And so when the moment came, six months or so later, that he was no longer on the earthly plane, it was an unbelievable tragedy because he had been the source of all that they wanted to take up for their life's work. Someone called Eleanor Merry describes a little bit how that was. Uh, she says, I was in headquarters, headquarters being the centre of the Anthroposophical Society at that time in uh, Gloucester Place in London. It was just before they moved to um, the present Rudolf Steiner House. I was in headquarters when the news arrived. His death was a terrible blow. We felt it would be heartbreaking to live and carry on his work as if he were still with us. We just could not believe, him, believe it. Everything that he had inaugurated or that was actually already in being had now to be carried on without him. It was impossible to fail him. And yet how could we carry on? So they really had to work with that and to come together to encourage each other to keep going, to really keep going that what was important needed to happen, and that's what he would want. And then came the announcement from the, from the first general secretary, because he had uh, already in 1923 founded the Anthroposophical Society. The general secretary was then called Harry Collison. And this is what he wrote on hearing the news of Rudolf Steiner's death. He sent a message to all the members in Great Britain. In making this sad announcement, I am aware that the personal loss on the physical plane is hard to bear. But from our knowledge, we know how Rudolf Steiner would regret if any of us lingered by the roadside to indulge in personal grief. We were brought into the movement by the hope that the spirit is victor over matter. Dr. Steiner has transformed that hope into a firm assurance and it will be a test of our faith to preserve more strongly than ever in the firm conviction of the truth he has given us 
and with the steady resolve to carry on the work he has entrusted to our care in closer communication with his sunlit spirit. Harry Collison, General Secretary, Anthroposophical Society in Great Britain. So this life that had started on the 27th of February, 1861, ended on the 30th of March, 1925. And now we really are, as I mentioned earlier, a hundred years on and more from these events, but a hundred years off since the founding of the Anthroposophical Society in Great Britain. And that leaves us with very big questions that we're going to be working with now, because we can't now keep looking back, simply delving into the books and remembering what was said a hundred years ago. The time is passing now. We have to live it more strongly than ever. I believe this is my feeling. What Rudolf Steiner intended then, but how we live it in the world now. And that is the question we have to wrestle with now and into the future. Yes, well, wonderful, Marietta. Thank you very much for that um, very, yeah, elaborate and full presentation. It was really really quite something and I think we could probably go on for another few hours uh, maybe we could have a part two if you were up for it some some point um could I ask just one more question just to just before we finish today and that mm -hmm. is for a lot of people the concept of belonging to some kind of society or some kind of group um is not really a part of their consciousness today a lot of people just we we think of ourselves as wanting to be as free as possible as individual as possible and that's an impulse that's that's good and true and right as well but what 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 is the anthroposophical society in a nutshell and and why would anyone join it what well, you know i i just have to say personally from for, for a long time i'd heard of it and I'd been reading Steiner for years and years and years and, and practicing the meditations, but didn't really know what the society was. I didn't know you could join it. I didn't know why you would join it and all these things. Uh, so I wonder if you could just very briefly for those who don't know what the society is, maybe they don't want to belong to a society. <laughs> yeah. Is that possible? To First go of there all, first? I resonate very much with what you've just said about people not wanting to belong to a society anymore. I think that's very much a general feeling. Probably, maybe even a very healthy feeling in a certain way of wanting one's freedom, not want to be hem hemmed in by any sort of constraints from from with you know from around one in that way, um, and that that is very. And I too, I mean, I took a, a good while before I started the amp before I joined for for exactly those same reasons, and I wanted to be really sure that I wanted to do that before I did it, and not just do it out of conventional habit or what my parents or friends might have expected with, of me. Uh, and that has grown much stronger, I think, over the years. So why would one want to join? Very legitimate question. Um, well, I think there are two reasons. And I think the most important of the two is that in joining, one is supporting something one feels important. Sorry, you know, Marietta. In, I just, in, I just joining the, in joining the Anthroposophical Society, one is supporting something supporting, okay. that feels important for the world. Um, because you, as you rightly say, you can buy all the books very easily. You can read everything you want to very easily. You don't have to join anything. But if if the content of anthroposophy, if it means something in your life, if it says this is important for me, or this is important for the world, or this is important for a sustainable future, or Earth, or or for a healthy education, and this 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 is valid and should exist in the world, then joining the anthroposophical society supports the work that the Anthroposophical Society does. That's the one part of it. And you may ask, well, what is that work? Well, we try and um, bring, uh, for example, lectures and conferences that are relevant and apparent and, and helpful and uh, for people and that can help them further in their questions and their searching. Uh, we try and support all the different initiatives that are happening around Great Britain and um, and help them with resources and ideas and networking, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a newsletter that brings people together. We have all over the country and many groups where people who may be reading on their own may find great, great help in coming together with others. You don't necessarily always have to be a member, but many of those people are members. And um, 
and you can uh, you can meet like-minded people and have great conversation that like you and I met in Penn Myanmar. That was a, a conference that was instigated and it was supported by the Manifest Society in Great Britain, but it was instigated in at the headquarters in Switzerland in Dornach. Um, it was their idea to do it and we joined in with them and that was created and developed. And there we met many people from different parts of the world um, who were interested in, in the particular subject we were working on at that moment. So there are many things, many things you can do in connecting and in deepening by joining uh, and in supporting the further work of the Anthroposophical Society. But there's all that, that's the one thing, but there also is what it can do for you. You know, and it may do a lot for you in feeling you are connected in a community because the the life of community um, learning, community research, community sharing of these sometimes very difficult, very dense ideas. And people can get stuck and think, what do I do with this sentence or this book? You know, I'm deeply interested, but I don't feel I'm making progress. Well, to meet with other people and to help each other along together in sharing um what one is benefiting and work and learning from a particular work of Dr. Steiner's, or um, where one feels difficulties or disagrees and wants to discuss that, these can be great, a great, great help on one's own inner path. So to sum up, it's both about developing one's own inner path further by the the benefit of being in a wider circle of people who are largely going in the same direction, each in their own individual way, but one can feel a companionship on a road that is sometimes not an easy road. And at the same time, saying yes to anthroposophy, the world in the world is a good thing. And I want to stand behind that with my support, with my support of joining the society in which nothing is asked of you. Nobody asks what you believe. Nobody asks what you think. Nobody asks what you've done in your life. Anybody can join the anthroposophical society. It's open to anybody who who feels drawn towards it uh, and nobody asks you there are other things you can do where taking up responsibilities um, for anthroposophy may be a further step but there's no responsibility at all uh, in joining the society other than saying this is something worth supporting and i want to stand behind it i want i want my life my time here on earth to to also include in it the support for something that is there for the world for the benefit of the world and for all people and I think that's very important because it, anthroposophy can seem like an exclusive club. I regret that very much. That has sort of happened from time to time, but it shouldn't be that at all. It isn't that in its in its fundamental nature. It's for everybody. Everybody searching with an inner life and questions. Well, I think that's a wonderful place to to finish up for today thank you so much for this conversation we we did meet briefly in penman mower in in wales at the conference and i really enjoyed the talk there and so to to hear it uh some of that content again but we actually go a little bit deeper and have this um personal conversation as well has been really wonderful for me and i hope for the listeners and viewers as well so marietta thank you once again and uh i look forward to meeting you again sometime and possibly having a further conversation if you'd like to i certainly would it's been uh, delightful to meet you and your questions and questions are always an invitation to think so when you ask me questions it takes me into new places too and i find that very very helpful and thank you for that thank you so much my pleasure all the best and talk to you again soon Thank you very much for listening to the Spiritual Scientist podcast. You can support us to continue creating the show by becoming a member on YouTube and receive lots of member benefits such as early release videos, member-only chat, and much, much more. Just go down to the bottom of the video where it says join and click on that button to find out more. If you prefer to become a member off YouTube, then you can go to uh, subscribestar.com slash Mick Young. That's subscribestar.com slash Mick Young. These links are also in the description to the video. And other ways to support the show are to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or simply like, share the video and comment on the video. And also, uh, at the time of recording, uh, I'm still actually offering a free spiritual development consultation with me personally. So if you're interested in that, just head over to spiritualscientist.com 
dot org slash call that's spiritual scientist dot org slash call and look forward to seeing you again soon thanks for tuning in bye for now